Good afternoon. I'm Brenton Simons, President and CEO of New England Historic Genealogical Society and American Ancestors. And welcome to a special program with Peter O'Donoghue, York Herald at the College of Arms London on the subject of that great institution in the 18th century. Before we begin, if you are not already a member of our society, we welcome you to visit AmericanAncestors.org and explore our many resources, including more than 1.4 billion records. Today, we serve more than 355,000 members in 139 countries. Our mission to educate, inspire, and connect individuals through our online resources, scholarship, personal services, and programs is carried out via our website, periodicals, award-winning publications, and by more than 200 programs a year, including conferences, online seminars, and tours. We provide premier experiences in family and local history for people of all ages and backgrounds, and we hope you will take advantage of some of our many offerings. The subject of heraldry played a role in our founding in 1845. Charles Ewer, our first president, wanted our society to be a genealogical and heraldic institute. While genealogy won out as the primary subject of our focus, heraldry was addressed 19 years later, when in 1864, our Committee on Heraldry was established. Since that time, we have at intervals published a roll of arms and amassed an archival collection of heraldic manuscripts and printed sources. Many of the leading heraldists have served as members of our committee, including in my tenure, the late Sir Anthony Wagner and the present Garter King of Arms, Sir Thomas Woodcock. We are especially pleased to welcome Peter O'Donoghue this afternoon as our honored speaker. I have worked closely with Peter over several years, both in a grant of arm and in documented, documenting pedigrees associated with the grant of arms made to my maternal family in the 16th century. I enthusiastically recommend our speaker as an outstanding agent at the College of Arms for anyone interesting, interested in exploring opportunities for engagement there. Now, please welcome my colleague, Ryan Woods, Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at our society, who also happens to be the Chairman of our Committee on Heraldry, to introduce our distinguished speaker, the York Herald, and our moderator, Nathaniel Taylor, Registrar of our Committee on Heraldry. Thank you once again for joining us. Thank you, Brenton. As the chair of the Committee on Heraldry at the New England Historic Genealogical Society, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Peter O'Donoghue was appointed York Herald at the College of Arms by letters patent of Her Majesty the Queen on May 31st, 2012. He previously served as Blue Mantle Persevant beginning in 2005. Educated at Dulles College in a Gonvo and Keys College, Cambridge, before becoming an officer of arms at the college, Peter worked as an assistant to two Windsor Heralds, Theo Matthew and William Hunt, while simultaneously developing his own flourishing professional genealogical research and archive practice. Since 2010, Peter has been the librarian of the College of Arms, responsible for the management of its archive department, and he's also the editor of the College of Arms quarterly newsletter. Away from the world of heraldry and genealogy, Peter is president of St. John's Ambulance Greater London. Before we hear from Peter this afternoon, I will briefly turn the program over to my colleague on the Committee on Heraldry, our registrar, Nathaniel Lane Taylor. In addition to his service on the committee, Nat, who earned his PhD in medieval European history, is the editor and publisher of the American Genealogist and a fellow of the American Society of Genealogists. Nat. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, I'm Nathaniel Taylor, Registrar of the Committee on Heraldry of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Our committee is made up of both volunteers and staff of the NEHGS, 
since 1864, we've been charged with researching heraldry in America as a vital sister subject to genealogy. In addition to research, publication, and events like this one, a keystone of our activities is compiling the role of arms of historic coats of arms borne by European settlers in the American colonies or immigrants to the United States. But this project dates back to 1915. Uh, we expect to publish the next installment of the role of arms this winter. We also record modern coats of arms borne by Americans, including arms that have been conferred uh, from the College of Arms, as well as arms privately designed or conferred by other foreign heraldic authorities. Uh, details of our activities and how to register coats of arms with us are available at our microsite, uh, committeeonheraldry.org. As Brenton mentioned, our relationship with the College of Arms is of long standing. English heralds have been consultants to our committee uh, and occasionally our guests for over 80 years. Of course, the college is considerably older than that. As a corporation, it dates back to 1484, and some of its constituent heraldic offices date back much further into the Middle Ages. Today, the College of Arms is among the very few state delegated heraldic authorities remaining in the world. Our own upstart republic had never created an equivalent authority. Our guest today, York Herald Peter O'Donohue, is speaking on the College of Arms in the 18th century, of interest to us in these former colonies because that was the last century in which the college had heraldic jurisdiction over us. Uh, but I'm glad to say our ties of affection remain strong. Uh, as a technical note, the presentation will be followed by questions uh, and you can type questions using Zoom's chat feature accessible from the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll then relay them in our Q&A session uh, to follow the talk. And fo further follow-up questions can be posed by email uh, to heraldry at nehgs.org. Uh, without further ado, York Herald, Peter O'Donohue. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all of you for such a kind and um, warm welcome. It's such a pleasure to be talking to you um, and to so many American friends on this subject. Now, heraldry, as you probably know, has always been an immensely flexible system. It's been able to uh, have different functions at different times and to convey a range of different meanings. The strongly military and chivalric connotations of the medieval period have been gradually replaced by other forms of significance. Heralds themselves like to think of themselves as flexible and able to change with the times. They've adopted a succession of related but different roles as opportunities presented themselves. To begin with, of course, deeply involved in tournaments and then in diplomacy and international messenger carrying, they became uh, involved in what you might call public relations, in the branding of companies, courts, countries, city-states. And they've always been involved in court ceremony and issues of precedence. The College of Arms itself is most significantly involved now in heraldic registration and regulation and also has been for centuries deeply involved in genealogy. The 18th century though, was a period of adjustment between different forms of meaning for heraldry and for the different roles of heralds and their college. It was a period when older models of what heralds could and should do and what heraldry could mean were replaced by newer ones. The early years of the 18th century were difficult ones for the college, perhaps the most difficult since its foundation in 1484. The principal mechanisms for the control of arms and the most important sources of income for the officers had all come to an end. The story of the century is thus one of reinvention. With the old ways no longer available, the institution had to find new activities, new ways of earning respect and a new clientele. In this, it was highly successful. The century ended with the college high in the estimation of the world, active and with income from the officers still rising. But first, we're going to start to understand why it was that things had come so low. Heraldic funerals were an important source of income for the college and the officers in the 16th and 17th centuries. They consisted of a long procession bedecked with heraldic flags, following the coffin, following by the display of the coffin on a temporary hearse on, in the church, and culminating in a funeral service in which the heraldic and chivalric elements, such as the sword, spurs, shield, and so on, were in evidence. 
no heraldic funeral could take place without the certificate of the Kings of Arms. This is an example. And the college gained a monopoly in the organization and provision of flags and other heraldic artwork. These uh, funerals are amazing um, chivalric displays, but they were on the wane from the 1670s onwards. And the entry of these funeral certificates in the college records almost ceased after 1691. The reasons for this change are quite complicated. The changing fashions in funerals has got to be key. The full pomp and display of the heraldic funeral was just no longer required. Chivalry itself was no longer at the core of how the gentry thought of themselves. These funerals were too expensive. They cost a huge amount to prepare all of the different forms of heraldic artwork in a short time. There was the rise of funeral firms, undertakers, that competed with the heralds in the supply of heraldic artwork, and the rise of the herald painters themselves, who quite liked to cut out the heralds as middlemen and be commissioned directly by those organizing funerals. The heraldic funerals of the English and Welsh counties were formally instigated in 1530, although similar inspections of uh, coats of arms had taken place before then. The heralds visited each county and summoned those describing themselves as gentry to appear before them. This was a key part of their regulatory apparatus. The gentry had to state their arms, by what right they bore them, and produce evidence if they could, and the pedigree of the family was recorded. It was a vital part of the official control of the use of arms, and it extended the college's prestige and authority across the country. The heralds would travel to different county towns and summon gentry people to appear before them. It was also an opportunity of profit for the heralds and the college, and a way of persuading people to have a grant or more often a confirmation. No commissions for visitations, however, were issued after 1688. They came to a complete end. As with the funerals, social change is probably at the root of this. The Whig magnates disdained these social distinctions such as heraldry, which they shared with the minor gentry. It lumped them all in too much together. And there also there was a recognition in the ministry that many of the rising and influential gentry families were not properly armigerous, despite their use of arms, and the government simply did not want to infuriate and offend them. The Court of Chivalry was the legal forum for heraldic disputes, and the court where cases of breaches of the law of arms, the law governing coats of arms, were heard. It was revised in, revived in 1687 to 1707, but it lost much, most of its reputation in certain cases where those prosecuted appealed to the common law courts with varying degrees of success. This challenged its authority and undermined the legal status of the control exercised by the college. So no new proctors were appointed to the court from 1708 until its revival in 1732. Thomas Howard, the eighth Duke of Norfolk, succeeded his uncle Henry as Earl Marshal in 1701. The Earl Marshal, you'll recall, is the uh, household official with a supervisory role over the College of Arms. The Earl Marshal was disqualified from activity in this office, which supervises the college and makes recommendations to the Crown for appointments. And since, until 1704, this was because he was a minor, and after, after that, because he was a Roman Catholic. Catholics at this time were not allowed to exercise public office. So the office was exercised by five deputies in succession between 1701 and 1732. These frequent changes were not beneficial to the college. There was no stability in its overall governance. And having two masters, the deputy Earl Marshal as well as the Earl Marshal, divided power and meant that two sets of patronage networks had to be satisfied. The appointment of a new deputy Earl Marshal in 1706 resulted in a welter of instructions from his office. These included the order to fully index and list every single coat of arms in existence. Now, if you know anything about heraldry and the records of coats of arms, you'll know that this is completely unrealistic and impossible, especially with the limited funds and staff available at the college. So the college simply ignored these instructions. But one change was significant. Before 1706, the profits of work that came to the offices in waiting, which is the rotor system by which we take it on turns to be on duty, the profits were divided between all the officers of the college according to a calculated scale. Those in waiting who actually did the work received a double share, but other officers also got a share no matter what they did. 
we've got records of these divisions of money called partition books, which are some of our oldest administrative records at the college, and they date back to the early years of the 16th century. From 1706 onwards, the herald and pursuivant in waiting kept all profit from searches, genealogy, and other work for themselves. This encouraged active and skilled officers to build up private practices. It would take a long time for this change to really bear fruit though. The appointment of Henry St. George as Garter in 1703 in succession to his brother brought more troubles than benefits. He was aged 77 and he held the office until his death aged 90. John Anstis, we'll come upon him in a minute, was thought to have described him as a timorous animal governed by every creature, minding only his iron chest and the contents of it. So Henry St. George's appointment left a vacancy as Clarence King of Arms, the second most senior herald, which was filled by John Vanborough, who was 40 years old and already made two reputations. He started as a writer of witty and entertaining plays, which were faithful mirrors of his world, rollicking comedies on marital disharmony. He was brutally attacked by the critic Jeremy Collier in 1698 for immorality in his plays, which might have induced him to turn to architecture, his second great career. In 1699, Charles, the Earl of Carlisle, commissioned him to design a new palace in Yorkshire to be known as Castle Howard. In 1702, Lord Carlisle was Deputy Earl Marshal as well as First Lord of the Treasury. To reward his architect, he appointed Vanborough as controller of the Board of Works. This was not inappropriate as Vanborough was an architect at least. But in June 1703, Carlisle nominated Vanborough as Carlisle Herald Extraordinary as a necessary step to his being made Clarence O' King of Arms. This is his coat of arms confirmed in 1714, quartering those of his mother's family, the Carltons. This appointment exemplifies the difficulties the college and a lot of other institutions had in an age of patronage and interest. The Deputy Earl Marshal and the Earl Marshal himself, himself had circles of clients seeking advancement and appointments to profitable offices. Only by making such appointments and advancing their friends could magnates preserve their power and influence. So the college was a victim in a number of cases of the appointment as officers of quite unsuitable people who had the ear of either the Deputy Earl Marshal or the Earl Marshal. This particular case of Vambra was really the worst because the Earl Marshal was underage and had no influence and the college was open to Whig patronage as it wasn't to be afterwards. Vanborough knew nothing of heraldry and had no interest in it. He'd even made a herald a figure of mockery in one of his plays. But he did, despite this, he did have some pride in his appointment. It seems as though uh, he still recognized that it was a worthy office to hold. Portraits of him regularly include his jewel as Clarenceau. This is his little device that he wears on a, on a ribbon around his neck and Clarenceau King of Arms still wears much the same device today. Very few grants were made during this period. The college records become somewhat sparse and there were problems in the reliable registration of the acts of the Kings of Arms. And you'll understand that reliable record keeping is absolutely critical in this kind of institution. Despite St. George's age and Vanbrugh's ignorance, the heraldry of the period is actually pretty good. This is the arms of Sir Ambrose Crowley, not a bad design. Crowley was the son of an other Ambrose who'd become life as a humble nailer, maker of handmade nails, but had built up a successful business as an ironmongery manufacturer. Sir Ambrose in turn greatly expanded this business, supplying the expanding armed forces with iron products during the constant warfare of the late 17th and early 18th centuries. Later in life, as perhaps the greatest industrialist of his age, he became a large shareholder and director of the South Sea Company, which attempted to float the national debt, and he pioneered factory-based production. A pedigree was placed on record at the college at the same time as the grant to Sir Ambrose. This just sets out a little bit of information about him, his parents and grandparents and his children. And it's a brilliant innovation at the time when the visitations had come to an end. It filled something of that gap. Nevertheless, Vanbrugh's appointment to the second highest place of the college caused great resentment. It disappointed the ambitions of everybody below him. They were howls of rage. Gregory King, for example, the most distinguished and senior herald, who is now much more famous as an early statistician and social analyst, was overlooked. Vanbrugh sold his place to Knox Ward in 1725 for 3,000 pounds, a vast sum, a year before his death. 
Although it wasn't unknown before, the practice of selling offices at the college was inaugurated after the revolution by the sale of the place of Portcullis Percivant by Thomas Holford in 1689 to Lawrence Crump. And the practice carried on until 1763, after which the Earl Marshal put a stop to it as far as he could. What happened was an officer who wished to resign looked around for a candidate willing to pay the maximum price for his place. This was not a way of finding the best candidates for appointment. But in those days, of course, there were no pensions, very little in the way of official income. And once it began, this was very hard to stop. If you bought a place, you felt it was reasonable for you to be allowed to sell it. Piers Mordewitt, another officer who is a good example of the difficulties that could arise from the sale of offices and the influence of a partial Earl Marshal. He bought the place of Windsor Herald from Thomas Holford in 1691. He was the son of a clergyman. His father had been a fellow of Exeter College, Oxford, until ejected in 1648 for adherence to the church. And he, to that is the established church. He then turned Puritan, only to lose his new place at the Restoration, so constantly changing his coat, but to no avail. Mordred himself was a good scholar, but he was extravagant. He was imprisoned for debt in 1693, but released after claiming the exemption from arrest as a member of the royal household. Unsurprisingly, perhaps this privilege for members of the household was soon, or soon later after removed. In 1710, Mordewitt, once more in debt, secretly removed and sold books from the college library. The worst crime you could commit as a herald where books are nothing short of sacred. Mordewitt had given, them mon given money to the porters to leave the gate open overnight. He'd taken the labels off the books and sold them to a bookseller who kept a stall near Christ Hospital, which is in the city of London, where they'd been spotted. Soon after this scandal had emerged, Mordewitt was arrested for debt and imprisoned. While in prison, he had the cheek to send in a claim to the college for his share of the partition fees due upon the installation of new knights and peers. And these were accompanied by scandalous reflections on his characters. He seems to have been an amazingly hard-boiled figure. Despite everything, Mordewitt was favoured by the Earl Marshal. So the college allowed him his fees due to his wretched state. He was restored to his office in 1711 and held it until he resigned in 1726. So a serious offence was dealt with very lightly because the college itself was not really flourishing or self-confident. During this period, royal occasions such as baptisms, marriages, funerals and thanksgivings became private rather than state occasions. This further deprived the college of prestige because the heralds, although they attended the ceremonies, they were not responsible for organizing them, which they had been before. Peter Leneve was a wealthy man and a noted antiquary. He was appointed Rouge Croix Percivant in 1690 and purchased the place of Richmond Herald in 1704, just in time to be appointed Norway King of Arms two days later on the death of Robert Devonish. Leneve was chairman of the Society of Antiquaries when it was founded in 1707 and its first president in 1717. He was greatly respected by his fellow antiquaries and built up a valuable library of books and manuscripts, including the Pastor Letters, famous collection of late medieval letters, now in the British Library. An important source for the personality of Leneve, as with so many 18th century heralds, is Stephen Martin Leake, who we'll meet a little later on, who was a writer of profuse and entertainingly personal memoirs of his career at the college. As we'll see, he delighted in recording observations of his colleagues. And some of us feel highly minded to do that today, but of course we wouldn't dream of it. Leneek knew Leneve for only the last five years of his life, by which time he, like so many heralds, had become eccentric. He wrote that Leneve was of a sordid, selfish disposition, valued himself upon his independency, cared for nobody, nor did anyone value him. He was middle-sized, fresh-coloured and wore a black wig, but never a good one or a good suit of clothes for the five years that I knew him. Like Leneve, John Anstis was an example of a high-caliber officer of arms who did much to help the college find new relevance in these very difficult times. He was a lawyer employed by the Earl Marshal to fight for his powers and authority, so Anstis became expert in the records of the Court of Chivalry and in public records generally which at that time were widely scattered in the tower and other places and highly disorganized. In time, he would probably know more about the public records than anybody else living. He decided he wanted to be Garter King of Arms and would stop at nothing to get there. To that end, he made himself indispensable to the Earl Marshal, 
obtained a special warrant about the public records from Queen Anne, and Eden even had himself elected MP for St. Germans in 1702. With the help of his influential Tory political friends, Anstis obtained a reversionary grant of the Gartership. This means he was granted uh, the right to have the office next time it was vacant. And he was effectively appointed Garter on the death of Henry St. George in 1715, although he had to a, fight a long battle with Vanborough, then Clarence King of Arms, which he'd won by May 1718, three years of confusion. Anstis continued to support the Tory opposition in the Commons until his retirement from politics in 1722. Despite his reputation as a Jacobite, Anstis was able to form a good re working relationship with Sir Robert Walpole. This is the splendid patent granting supporters to his son, created Baron Walpole of Walpole in 1723. Throughout mid medieval and Tudor times, the custom had existed of creating particularly noted knights at special times, such as coronations, by means of a particular ceremony, including a symbolic purification by bathing. It had last been used by Charles II at his coronation. In the 18th century, the government had the problem of how to reward political and military service without offering the permanent influence of a peerage, which of course gave you a seat in the Lords and a vote. Anstis had the idea of creating an order of knights, a similar, similar to the order of the Garter, with fixed numbers, statutes, officers, and a chapel. The brilliance of the Order of the Bath, which was founded in 1725, is that it clothed this innovation, this new order, in historical chivalric trappings. The novelty was hidden, and so the prestige was enhanced. They made out that it was a revival instead of something new. And since then, honour systems have very often appealed to medieval chivalry in this way, certainly in Britain. Even the Order of the British Empire, founded in 1917, draws upon this atmosphere of late medieval chivalry. That seems to be roughly where they get their prestige. Anstis had a remarkable breadth and depth of scholarship, had a mastery of primary sources, of biography and administrative and chivalric history, as well as being a knowledgeable genealogist and topographer. His great subjects were the history of the Court of Chivalry and of the Heralds, the Order of the Garter, and heraldic and chivalric antiquities in general. Having won the favour of Walpole with the foundation of the Order of the Bath, Anstis next tried to ensure that his son would become Garter after him. He was indispensable and could threaten to resign if his designs were not met. This was in 1726. When Walpole would not comply with Anstis's demand for a reversionary grant of the Gartership to his son John, Anstis said he would resign it instead in favour of any suitable replacement. Stephen Martin Leake was fortunately to hand as just such a threateningly suitable man. We'll consider him later. After a lot of negotiation, Leake agreed with Anstis a price of £4,000 for a reversionary grant of the Gartership. And this letter to Leake from Anstis reads, Dear Sir, it's with a great deal of pleasure that I now acquaint you that I this day have obtained liberty to surrender my patent from the Duke of Norfolk and that I shall appoint my successor. He concludes, this matter must be done at a heat, and I stay in town to effect it. I have another person who have offered me better terms since our first treaty. But there's something shady going on. Leek was brought forward only as a stalking horse. The deal having been agreed, Anstis had achieved his object of persuading the ministry and the Earl Marshal that he really would resign. This double dealing did not endear Anstis to Leek, but Leek got his revenge as in so many others when writing his memoirs saying that Anstis had a very bad address. He had a sneaking down designing look that betrayed the indication of his mind. He was likewise a sloven, took a great deal of snuff. He wanted all things called accomplishments in a gentleman. Leek did even handedly admit, however, that Anstis the Elder had a great capacity, genius and propensity to the study of antiquity. He had likewise the very great advantage of a very good memory, which was the more extraordinary considering he was given to drinking. It's a rather double, double-edged compliment. In the, end, in the end, Anstis was victorious and reigned jointly as Garter King of Arms with his son until his death in 1744. And thereafter, his son, John Anstis the Younger, reigned alone. Leake recorded that the younger Anstis was the counterpart of his father, the same swarthy complexion, but somewhat, something more ruddy, the same upright, stiff gait, bridling in his double chin, and tripping along with little steps and rarely moving his head, but with his body. He maintained his father's character of a sot and a Jacobite. 
the source of much insight into the activities, history and personalities of the first half of the 18th century is this Stephen Martin Leake, who filled several volumes with diaries and memoirs. His accounts are always interesting and often quite defamatory. He was born in 1702, the son of Stephen Martin, a captain in the Navy, who was made heir to his brother-in-law, Sir John Leake, an admiral, and who accordingly assumed the additional surname of Leake in 1721. This change of name and arms brought a first introduction to the College of Arms and to John Anstis. As soon as the bequest from Sir John Leake was received, it was almost cancelled out by losses of more than £20,000 in the South Sea crash. It became imperative for Leake to find a gainful position. John Anstis agreed terms to sell the gartership to Leake for £4,000, but as we've seen, this was merely a gambit in securing the reversionary grant of gartership for his own son. In 1727, Leake purchased the place of Lancaster Herald and was promoted to Norroy King of Arms on the death of Peter Leneve in 1729. He immediately directed his great energies towards reviving the fortunes of the college. The revived Court of Chivalry opened in the painted chamber of the Palace of Westminster on the 3rd of March, 1732. Stephen Martin Leake had done much of the preparatory work, despite Anstis's great knowledge of the court and its history. Three causes of office were prosecuted at its revival, relating to the unlawful display of arms at funerals. But the hearings made it appear to Leake and Anstis that the court of chivalry, without the exercise of visitations, was impractical, if not oppressive. Without the visitations, it wasn't easy for people to make their arms lawful or to find out whether they were unlawful. A prohibition against the court was moved for in the Kinnings Bench, which is another court, in 1732, but it was unsuccessful. The last case died out rather inconclusively in 1737, and the court was going to a deep sleep for over 200 years, until it awoke, much to many people's surprise, in, 17, in 1954. The closure of the court and the non-revival of visitations gave the impression in the public mind that the authority of the Earl Marshal was at an end. In 1735, only three grants were made. Leake was promoted to Clarenceau in 1741. He became convinced that all attempts to re-establish the old system would fail. There would be no more visitations, no more court of chivalry, no new charter or act of parliament to secure control of the heraldic painters or the registration of funeral certificates. The college, he felt, needed to look for new functions and services that it and the officers could provide. One example of such a new service was the promotion in 1747 of a scheme to register Jewish and dissenting births. At that time, without civil registration of births, those who weren't baptized in the established church could find it very hard to provide certificates of birth and nationality when required. This scheme was very attractive to many Jewish and dissenting groups, but sadly it was launched too soon before some of these groups had been properly consulted. It was a tactical blunder which proved the end of what had been a very imaginative and promising idea. We often wonder what it might have led to. It might have led to proper registration of births 100 years earlier. And it did continue to be used sporadically until 1793. John Warburton was appointed Somerset Herald in 1720. He was able, industrious, conceited, a liar and unscrupulous. He tackled the problem of finding a new source of income as a herald by publishing maps with coats of arms in the margins. Often they were inaccurate. The first maps appeared in the 1720s. This map of Middlesex has the arms of several hundred families around it, many of highly doubtful legitimacy. In 1748, Warburton, now the most senior of the heralds, revived the scheme, advertising that all the coats of arms included would be authoritative. But this was a gross overstepping of a herald's authority. It was not for him to rule on the correctness of arms and the publishing. Only the kings of arms have that power. On examination, it became clear that the arms shown were not properly researched and were often incorrect or wrongly ascribed. Warburton, as with other wrongdoers, was not adequately punished. When called to account, moreover, he attacked in turn and took to writing anonymous and scurrilous accounts of the dispute in the form of letters to newspapers. Following an interview with the Deputy Earl Marshal, in which the Earl Marshal failed to properly discipline Warburton, he had the following highly misleading advert inserted in the London Gazetteer. <clears throat> we hear that a few days since the Earl Marshal of England was at the Herald's office to reconcile the differences between the Kings of Arms and the Senior Herald 
in relation to the latter's right of publishing arms on the margin of his maps of the English counties. When the Earl confirmed the said herald's power and ordered him to proceed in so laudable undertaking. Needless to say, this was completely the opposite of what had happened. Warburton then wished to sell his place of Somerset, thinking himself so unpopular that his colleagues would be glad to be rid of him. The other officers, however, now wanted to keep him in as a punishment. So he remained a herald for another 10 years. Being vain and extravagant, wrote Leek, Warburton ran into debt and became a prisoner in the fleet prison. There he remained many years, but at length, getting his liberty, he returned to the office and having nothing else to depend on, set about devising how to make the most of it. And though he cheated many and was often detected, he, almost, he always brazened it out. Incidentally, when Warburton died in 1759, it became clear that he had a morbid horror of the idea of worms crawling on his dead body. I'm sorry about this, but he ordered that his body should be enclosed in two coffins, one of lead and the other of oak. The first should be filled with broom stalks to discourage the worms. At his funeral, a broom fermented and burst open the coffin, which sounds rather gruesome. As we've seen, this was an age of patronage. Political power came in great part from having the ability to reward supporters, or with lucrative or impressive offices. The college was treated as a venue for rewarding clients and demonstrating power by the government of the day and by those like the Howards who wished to demonstrate their influence. Both the Earl Marshal and his deputy had clients to gratify. Each was solicited by their friends and by ministers. A double claim on patronage had to be met. Besides, it was still felt in the 1750s that those who brought their, bought their places had a moral right to sell them to successors of their own choosing. But from 1755, these sales had to be clandestine as the Earl Marshal had expressed his wish to end them. The influence of patronage on purchase on the qualifications and abilities of those appointed to the college was often a bad one. William Olds, for example, who was appointed Norroy King of Arms, very senior office over the heads of all the heralds and pursuivants, was translated to the office from the fleet prison, where he'd been confined many years. His appointment was imposed by the Earl Marshal. John Martin Leake was promoted to be Garter King of Arms in 1754. This puts him at the head of the college hierarchy. He immediately took control of the Order of the Garter, bringing the official registers of, of the Order up to date and collecting drawings of the knight's stall plates. Despite his criticism of Anstice's arrangement with his son for the Gartership, and his opposition to unsuitable appointments over the heralds of heralds and pursuivants, he was himself responsible for the appointment of his own son, John Martin Leake, as Chester Herald in 1752, at the age of 13. His uncompromisingly low opinion of his fellow officers convinced him that the beat boy could be no worse. Leake argued that it is better to be too young than too old. The income of over £100 a year proved too much for a young boy who had very few expenses as he lived with his parents, and he became dissipated as a result. In 1767, the Earl of Egmont, a heraldic enthusiast and friend to the college, proposed to the House of Lords a resolution which was adopted as a standing order of the House in 1767. This meant that regular entries of the peers' pedigrees should be made in the college, that Garter should attend each first admission of any peer, and should deliver there a pedigree of the family on vellum, very luxurious and expensive, needless to say. This is the first pedigree to have placed on record in this way. It shows the family of the Earls of Effingham, then the Deputy Earl Marshal. Standing order itself was repealed in 1802, probably because of the elaborate machinery for the investigation of peerage claims, which had by then grown up, rendering the college records unnecessary. The heralds themselves were deeply involved in peerage claims, and it was a major part of their work. But this, the, the fact of this standing order did establish the principle that peerage family pedigrees should, like others, seek to be kept up to date at the college, and it lent prestige to the registration of pedigrees for all families. Stephen Martin Lee came into the college when it faced a sea of troubles, and without him it might well have foundered. He died on the 24th of March 1773, leaving the college well launched upon a major revival, for which he deserves a good share of the credit. His memoirs reveal a man of fierce energy and great ability, whose weaknesses, in early days at least, were a stiff unwillingness to compromise. As a scholar, he stands high, only a little below the rank of William Dugdale and John Anstis. He left a very valuable collection of manuscripts, and the college acquired 75 volumes of these in 1834, 
including a complete pictorial and descriptive record of the garter stall plates from the beginning to his own day. He also left collections of records of ceremonials, ordinances, armories, records of the order of the garter and the bath, of the court of chivalry, and an elaborate history of the heralds, and heralds like nothing better than learning about other heralds, but he doesn't seem to have been particularly interested in coats of arms or genealogy as such. He was perhaps the first of the new breed of active and scholarly heralds who led the way for the revival of the college in the second half of the 18th century. He and his younger colleagues, Hurd, Bigland and Brooke, were very well placed to initiate and participate in the revival of interest in the medieval period and in heraldry and genealogy, which were prompted partly by the Romantic movement. Sir Charles Townley was promoted Clarenceau in 1755. He was a diligent officer, but rich, proud and insolent. He was appointed Garter after the death of Leake on the 24th of March, 1773, but died after little more than a year and was succeeded by Thomas Brown, then Norroy King of Arms. Brown was as little note as a herald, but was the most eminent land surveyor in the kingdom, which acquired him the epithet Sense Brown to distinguish him from his contemporary, the elegant Lancelot Capability Brown. Mark Noble, historian of the college and almost as defamatory as Leake, said that Brown was originally a poor, ragged, lousy boy of very mean parentage, so dirty and infectious that he was, whilst a servant, banished the apartments and for a considerable time took up his lodgings on the college stairs. He seems to have been a servant or clerk to the Herald. It's interesting to think of a future garter having lived on the stairs of the college. Brown made a very good marriage and he was appointed an extraordinary Herald and took part in the coronation of George II. He became a very successful land surveyor under the patronage of the Earl Marshal. Brown was succeeded as Garter in 1780 by Ralph Bigland, who was born in 1711 and acquired property by marriage. Here are his arms, which consist of two ears of wheat, one of the classic heraldic subtle puns, because wheat, um, another word for the ears of wheat is big. They're shown with his wife Anne Wilkinson's arms on an escutcheon of pretense. Bigland has the rare distinction of being described in the Dictionary of National Biography as Herald and Cheesemonger. His interest in cheese was, it was seen, gradually overtaken by his interest in heraldry and in genealogy. Indeed, he was a genealogist of some reputation. Up to this point, genealogy had been thought of as the history of noble and gentry families, intimately connected to the history of estates. Bigland took an interest in family history for his own sake and investigated sources for the history of a far wider social range. His book on marriages, baptisms and funerals was published in 1764, and it was one of the very first genealogical textbooks that recognized the interest in and possibility of researching non-gentry families. By the 1770s, we know the Earl Marshal highly disapproved of the practice of acquiring appointments by purchase, but private transactions did in some case continue. This is John Charles Brooke. A number of his letters survive, he wrote to his father in 1772 about his aspiration to be appointed an officer. He said that the profits were great from attending the office and letting people know their arms, drawing out and entering their pedigrees, registering births, and so on. In his letters, he said that the business of college is now very great and keeps increasing, especially since the late order of the House of Lords, probably that regarding the registration of peers' pedigrees. Brooke says to his father that he's been applying himself to heraldry since infancy, and with no great modesty, he says that he has now a great knowledge of heraldry, antiquity and genealogy, such as few can excel. <laughs> he later said that he may have to pay, five, pay 500 pounds for the place as pursuivant and fees of about 70 pounds for the patent, which would be nearly all his fortune. This gives us an idea of the value of the appointment, how it was rated and the expected profits. Equivalent values today are almost impossible to calculate and pretty meaningless, but 500 pounds can be described as about nine years income for a skilled tradesman, so a really vast sum. John Charles Brooke was appointed Rouge Croix Pursuivant on the 1st of July, 1773. Brooke's arms, which include a hawk's lure, were granted to him and his brother in 1794. In the years after his appointment in 1773, he worked up a large professional practice probably with Sir Isaac Hurd, the largest in the college at that time. 
He was an accomplished heraldic artist, genealogist, and antiquary of considerable attainments. In the early, at the early age of 45, Brooke met a premature and tragic end with his friend and colleague, Benjamin Pingo. They were at the Haymarket Theatre on the 3rd of February, 1794, where a large crowd waited outside to get in. The doors suddenly opened and everybody pressed forward. Perhaps the people at the gate were not quick enough at taking the money because there was a terrible crush and the two heralds were killed by suffocation. His memorial in the Herald's Church, St. Bennet Paul's Wharf, tells us that he was a person of unrivaled eminence in his ancient and useful profession. Sir Isaac Hurd was born in 1730. He entered the Royal Navy aged 15 as a volunteer and served until 1751. He then set up as a merchant in Bilbao. He made several mercantile voyages across the Atlantic to Boston, Massachusetts, and maintained these transatlantic contacts throughout his life. The war with Spain in 1757 ended the prospect of profits from such travels, and Hurd was then appointed Blue Mantle in 1759 and promoted to Lancaster Herald in 1761. Within a few years, he'd become one of the two most professionally active and successful officers. He had a huge zeal and success as a genealogist. His period of activity coincided with the great accumulation of new industrial and mercantile fortunes in the latter part of the 18th century, with the naval and military honours in the French wars, and with significant additions to the peerage made by William Pitt. There was a new wave of prosperity at the college. Most of the Herald's clients at this period came from the lesser gentry and yeoman and merchant classes. Pedigrees were traced by probate records, parish registers, monumental inscriptions, and so on, and were then placed on official record. Bigland, Hurd, and their generation became experts in this work. This is an example of the extracts which he and his staff prepared from parish registers in the course of their research work. Hurd's first marriage was to an American, Catherine, daughter of Andrew Tyler, a widow of David Ocfaloni. He became stepfather to her three sons, including General Sir David Ocleone. He had strong connections with America by this marriage and by his earlier trading activities. He developed an American practice and made several grants of arms to those in American colonies immediately before the rebellion. He corresponded with George Washington about his ancestry. Connections between the College of Arms, which were forged by Hurd and others at the time, have remained so strong and constant ever since. And hopefully this lecture might uh, be part of that. We continue to act for you American clients in tracing families, and we're proud to grant a number of coats of arms each year to American citizens by our illuminated letters patent. Pictorial or landscape heraldry is particularly associated with Hurd's reign. This kind of design was hated by later heraldists, but it seems to me to encapsulate the psychological idea that a person becomes most themselves at moments of high drama and crisis. If you represent those moments, you express the essence of the person. An example is the grant made to Hurd himself when Lancaster Herald in 1762, which commemorates his escape from drowning in August 1750 when serving in the Man of War Blandford off the Guinea coast. A tornado carried him overboard with the mainmast of the ship while standing in the topsail yard. While the attention of the crew was directed to disencumbering the vessel from the wreck, he was observed, enveloped in the shattered rigging, and was rescued. It was an incredibly lucky escape. The additional attraction of this form was that depictions of military actions in heraldry could transform modern warfare into medieval chivalry. So we get brilliant um, heraldic designs with miniature pictures of forts bes being besieged, tiny soldiers marching across open ground. And a lot of people subsequently said that's not heraldry, that's departed from medieval principles. But in a way, what it's actually doing is transforming those modern conflicts into medieval chivalry. Sir Isaac Hurd died aged 91 in 1822. He'd held the office of Garter for 37 years, longer than anyone else before or since. I doubt it will ever be beaten. His extensive practice was continued after his death by John, James Pelman, Pullman and George Belts, <clears throat> both heralds who'd, become their, who'd begun their working lives at the college as his clerks. Hurd commanded much affection, was charming and urbane. He was benevolent. He had an extraordinary memory, a large circle of acquaintance. He's thought to have been morally and religiously pure. It sounds like such a contrast 
with some of the heralds we've early had, had described before. After the great difficulties of the early decades of the 18th century, when very few grants of arms were made, the visitations and heraldic funerals were at an end, when the court of chivalry's authority was declining, and the college was treated as a dumping ground for the Earl Marshal and Deputy Earl Marshal suitors. When it looked as though the college might become a home for inactive sinecurists with few duties and fewer powers. After all this, the college emerged greater than before. In the early years, Anstis dominated all things. And although a great scholar, he contributed little to the college as a whole, save for enhancing the prestige of the Earl Marshal. Stephen Martin Leake was much more effective but to developing a new direction for the college. By the time of Hurd, Bigland and Brooke, we're entering a rare golden age when the kings of arms are not at each other's throats and they all cooperated to an extent in developing the heraldic and genealogical practices of all. The times were in their favor. Many new peerages of the late 18th century together with the high levels of general prosperity and the great rise in the new gentry and professional classes all meant much more work for heralds. The antiquarian and romantic movements made these subjects more popular and available to the middle as well as the upper classes. The heralds continued to provide their expertise and attendance at royal ceremonies and state occasions, to arrange coronations and funerals, to make proclamations, and also to make occasional visits to assist in investing foreign princes with the garter. But in this new era, it would be research and design work at the college itself that would be the main focus of their energies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, your Carol Peter O'Donoghue. Uh, that was fantastic. And I spent much of the time you were speaking, uh, typing up all sorts of questions and ideas of my own. Uh, but I do see, and I'm glad to see that other people have chimed in as well, the Q&A column. Uh, Peter, can you see that, the Q&A column on your screen, uh, which is populated by some things? And, and as we talk just now, you might mm -hmm. see things that jump out at you. Uh, but I do want to claim the privilege of leading off with a, uh, one or two questions of my own, and I'll try to make them not too open-ended. Um, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your defense of landscape heraldry as a sort of psychological and iconographic successor to medieval heraldry. As a medievalist, uh, that interests me, and uh, uh, you know, I, I feel like I've been told to um, agree with everyone else who disparages landscape heraldry, but I've confess secretly that I am fascinated by it when one sees it done well. Uh, so that's not a question, it's just a thanks. Um, of course, like many Americans listening right now, I'm drawn to what you said very briefly about Isaac Hurd uh, and his correspondence with Washington is for many of us sort of the only thing we think of when we uh, think of the, um, you know, what the College of Arms meant for people from uh, the United States looking across. And, and I think it's a proxy for something that you may be aware of uh, as a larger volume. Uh, you mentioned that generation of Big London Herd as one where uh, the services of the heralds were of interest and were availed of by you know, not just the upper classes, the mercantile classes, the middling classes. Um, and my question to you is, as you see that volume of interest rise uh, and the professionalism of what the heralds can do arise, what is it that people seek? What is it that people sought in that generation uh, right around the, the time of, of Washington's correspondence with Heard? From the colonial perspective, uh, many of us do what we do because we are in search of our origins, our connections. Uh, of course, some of the people approach the, herald, uh, the heralds much more specifically for uh, a claim to a peerage or uh, a design and adoption of a coat of arms or the confirmation of one that, that may have existed to which they uh, want to claim. Um, so what can you say about the kinds of questions that are brought to the college uh, in that era? Do they change? Uh, and particularly genealogy for genealogy's sake, you say that you know, Bigland did that uh, by mm. offering a, a kind of methodological uh, work, maybe the first of its kind in that as well. Um, so does one see that looking at the sources you have uh, in terms of what brought people in the door in that generation? I think that um, there's, uh, <clears throat> they probably, a lot of them were motivated by the same sorts of considerations that, that families 
British families and families um, from everywhere in the world motivated by, which is a desire to know their ancestry, to have it looked into, confirmed, studied. Um, very often they had an idea of who they were descended from and they were looking for that to be supported. Um, in the 18th century, it was very common for people to be looking to connect themselves to known gentry families from earlier centuries in Britain. So families which appear in the visitations, they, they, they thought they were descended from them and they wanted that to be studied and confirmed. And quite often in the, those 18th century inquiries, I think did result in those ties being, being looked at and being confirmed because it was an expensive business to engage a herald um, across a transatlantic communication with a herald uh, was not cheap and um, for the research work would be very time consuming and expensive in itself. Of course, we're so used to genealogical research work today being relatively sedentary uh, in, in as much as um, so much has been digitized and placed, made available online. In the 18th century, uh, to, to study a family, you needed to write to every single incumbent parish priest and pay them a fairly hefty fee of sometimes several pounds to transcribe a single entry. So it was not a cheap, not a cheap undertaking, checking a genealogical descent. Um, and there was no public record office. So records of wills were widely scattered in various ecclesiastical register offices and so on. So it was a much more complicated and difficult process. I think they were looking to, looking to, uh, prove their descent from visitation families in many, many cases. Uh, and to the inevitable follow-up, uh, were they most of the time disabused of that notion? Uh, and was also that uh, motivation as visible from inquiries from within England as well as people from overseas then? Yeah, I think, I think it was much the same. I think it was much the same. Um, in, Eng in English inquiries, the, there are a whole sort of set of other sorts of considerations which don't do dominate things so much. For example, peerage claims, um, peerage and baronetcy claims are incredib became incredibly important and but one of the most important parts of the college's activities during the late 18th and 19th centuries. And that dominated a lot of their research work, in fact, proving or disproving clear peerage claims. Um, and the, um, yeah, there are various other sort of things that to do with um, changes of name and arms often require genealogical research work to be done because they're often contingent upon proving genealogical connections. Um, but those things don't crop up so much in the American cases. So with the American families, it's more straightforward genealogical work. My impression is that the 18th century inquiries were more likely to result in the successful proof of a descent from a visitation family than perhaps statistically later inquiries might do. It's partly the passage of time. We're talking about 200 years later and perhaps eight or nine generations later, the likelihood of geneal genealogies having gone astray or the lines of descent having become confused is that much greater now. Right, uh, let me offer one other observation on that. Uh, I think it also correlates with the broader availability of published sources with which one can find something to latch on to for one's wishful thinking about one's own family. When there are fewer things were, were out there, uh, if you knew about this visitation family you know, before any of those were published, it was more likely that you might have known about it because you actually were related to them. Uh, I think there are some other, uh, sorry, uh, there are some other questions here that are of much more general mm -hmm. type and, and I think we should turn to. Uh, there's a wonderful one uh, that came in several minutes ago. In this day and age, are women granted coats of arms? Women definitely are granted coats of arms. They always have been. Um, there's ne never been a time when women didn't bear arms. I mean, from long before the College of Arms existed, women women bore coats of arms. Um, and in fact, some of the very earliest um, designs that we know about are, are designs which, were, which reflect a female line connectedness between families, because uh, that was always an immensely part of, important part of people's identity, um, especially where large estates were involved, of course. Um, so we do grant arms to women. The only, the only concern, the difficulty we have is that we are bound by the law uh, in Britain, the law governing how coats of arms work, which means that women cannot transmit coats of arms to their descendants. Um, and we, we, we don't necessarily like that, but we are, it would require an act of parliament to change it. 
but we do grant coats of arms to women all the time, yeah. Thank you, that's very good. Uh, there was one follow-up question to the previous, uh, the previous topic, uh, and that was, um, you know, in this era of sedentary instantaneous genealogy, uh, one thing that might be worth clarifying is, is the amount of time as well as the expense required in the kind of research that in Bigland and Hurd's generation, uh, heralds were willing to offer, uh, particularly for a query from overseas. Uh, you know, this is something that could drag on how long, months, years? Oh, yes. Well, of course, it would take six months for one communication to cross the Atlantic quite often. So, um you know, with all the vagaries of trade winds and so on. Um, so yeah, it, it was a long and drawn out process. And one of the reasons we've got these many, many volumes of extracts and transcriptions from parish registers, from will registers and so on, <clears throat> is just precisely because it was so much more efficient to send a researcher to a parish and ask them to just transcribe the whole parish register or to make detailed extracts from it than it was to sort of send one inquiry and then another inquiry and then another inquiry. So we've got, you know, literally hundreds and hundreds of manuscript volumes of extracts and transcriptions from parish registers, which were created because that was so much more efficient. And it was really a sort of result of, um, of the, the complexities and the time, vast amounts of time required in, uh, in carrying out this kind of research. And in some cases, those copies might be the ones that survive when the originals have since been destroyed. Yeah, that can happen. Yeah, that, that does that does happen. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, sometimes there are sometimes they are highly selective in what they extract. So we have to be careful about that. Um, it's not that unusual to find that what you think is a transcription of a parish register is actually a transcription which only includes people who are called gentleman or esquire or armiger or something like that. So in other words, they've left out everybody they didn't think might be relevant. So um, we have to be careful about that. But no, sometimes sometimes our transcriptions are the only surviving records. I mean, Devon and Cornwall wills are a notorious case. Uh, the registry was was destroyed in the uh, by enemy action in the Second World War. And we've got volumes of transcriptions of a lot of those wills they are immensely useful now. Thank you. Um, uh, I see another question that uh, that takes us in a different direction entirely, uh, and this is um, wait now I have to find it. Uh, oh, wait, oh yes, and the the querent offered he mentioned oh he said this is a far out question. Um, has DNA been used yet to trace lines of inheritance, or prove a right to a coat of arms, uh, and take that however you wish? Well, the thing about DNA evidence is that it's in most forms it's immensely useful for disproving connections, of course. And it's very good for proposing statistical likelihoods of connectedness and suggesting how long ago that connection might have taken place. It's not particularly good at confirming specific lines of descent. So you could say this, these two, I mean, obviously we've only got the DNA of living people. We're not going to start digging up people from 500 years ago and testing their DNA. So you, all you can do is compare two people and make a statement as to the degree of connectedness between them and the likelihood of there being a common ancestor. What it doesn't tell us is how that common ancestry might arise or whether your particular proposed line of descent is the right one. You might have, you know, you might be going through one line and actually the correct answer is another. So it's useful in some circumstances. It can be very important, particularly in diagnosing what we call non-paternity events, um, but, but it, it has its limits. Right. Um, I'm remembering uh, there was one, and I think it was now three, four years ago, uh, where DNA did alter the succession to a baronetcy, I believe. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'm not sure whether you or any of the, the heralds in the College of Arms uh, would have been involved with that. Uh, have you been involved uh, with a case, uh, a private genealogical case, or a case of succession to arms or title uh, where it did uh, become an issue like that? No, I've not been involved. The Pringle case was a Scottish right. baronetcy case, so we weren't involved in that. Oh, of course. Um, and again, that was a case of diagnosing non-paternity. Yeah. So it's a case, it's an example of where DNA is incredibly useful in, in that it diagnoses non-paternity rather than paternity. Yeah, there's, there are some sort of shenanigans to do with that case, which are quite bizarre. But um, I've not personally been involved in any in any case like that today, but it's 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 it'll happen. I mean, it's inevitable. It, it, will, it happen. will happen. That's that's a good answer. Um, in another direction entirely, uh, Sharon uh, 
uh, remembers the slide you uh, displayed of Sir Isaac Hurd's arms. Uh, and sh as she remembered it, I don't have a copy of it on my screen. The same image was in all four quarters or just in two of them? I, I, I can't remember. It's a quartered image with the Neptune figure in, not in all four, just in, in one and four, is it? Yeah, one and four, yeah. Okay. Uh, and what is, what was, I can't remember the quartering then. Uh, um, so I, th I think that was the, the, the querent may have just misremembered that. So that, that's very typical uh, two coat quartering then. I think it's, um, yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's probably the maternal arms are being being displayed with his, uh, I can't, quite honestly, I can't remember exactly what the details of that are. I'm very sorry, but it's an interesting case of an older coat of arms being courted by what was at that time dangerously, alarmingly modern, I suspect. Right, but 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 well contextualized by you. I, I have a new appreciation for those. And and I think the interest in that coat of arms is they sit well together, as you just said. They do, yeah. yeah. Um, so let's see, I'm not sure whether you are seeing the same scroll of questions uh, and whether yes. things jump out at you. Yeah, um, let me see. Uh, starting from the top. Dr. Well, Ju Dr. Well, Juby. Well, let, me, let me squeeze in with one, one other that I had. And, um, and it was backing up a little bit in your narrative, going to the early 18th century revival of the, or you know, attempted revival of the court of chivalry. Uh, and then thinking of the, the uh, equally peculiar 1954 case and a, a, a sort of an experimental revival. C could you comment more on, on, on those two things? You know, it, was, it, was it essentially the same, uh, the same sort of, um, uh, you know, the same ambition and the same result, or were they substantively different? They were, they were, they were different in that the 18th century cases were causes of office generally, so mm. they tended to be prosecutions, um, whereas the 1954 case was a dispute between two parties. In other words, it was one, one party suing another <clears throat> for, uh, um, for abusing their armorial rights. Um, and the 1954 case, I don't know in detail the background to how that case came to happen, but I think it was cooked up. You know, it, it, very, very uh, much so. It was a, it was a cooked up civil case, so that is very different. Then it's, yeah. it was an attempted use of the court in a different way, uh, yeah. but the result was the same. It was shut down. Uh, there was a huge but, amount of discussion in the 18th century about whether it would be possible to have an act of parliament passed to to place all of this sort of regulation on a statutory footing because the heralds were, were sort of conscious that without a statutory basis for it, there would always be arguments about the, the powers and rights of the court of chivalry and other courts. And remember the courts were a, to, to a degree competitive. Right. The, 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 the uh, officers of one court quite keenly sought cases because that's how they earn their livings. So they were very, other courts were quite keen to, to take over these sorts of cases. And to, and to put down to, the court of chivalry was was by no means unique in that in this yeah. competition among courts. Um, another good question uh, that takes in, us in another uh, direction, but um, is very good question for you in your role as librarian of the college. Uh, are the college's records uh, open to outside researchers, say doctoral students, uh, and how has that changed uh, over time? And and are we seeing perhaps a trend towards uh, accessibility of finding aids or other ways to 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 look at the collections uh, as in, in general we don't have the resources to we don't have a public search room so we don't have the resources for members of the public to carry out research work in our archives and it's an immensely specialist archive of course with thousands and thousands of manuscript volumes of huge sort of great preciousness which in most repositories will probably never be looked at at all um, so we don't have we don't have facilities for members of the public to carry out research work. We have a students room for visiting scholars, which is very busy and heavily used, although sadly it's been empty for the last 18 months because of the coronavirus. We're just now starting to have scholars come back to, to work in it. They are, yeah, they're, they're mostly doctoral or above um, working on their own particular um, subjects. So it's it's been suggested to us that this uh, and I didn't announce it as that, but that that could or should have been our, our final question. But just uh, to ask for a little bit more clarification about that for visiting scholar uh, reading room or readers ticket access. So there is a mechanism now that that exists, of course, in the pandemic. It hasn't been made use of. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, yeah, so any, I mean, scholars, we, we've, we've, we've long time had, had a student's room for scholars to, to, to work and, um, the, but the, it's not for people chasing they have family history or uh, that sort of thing. It's, uh, it's historians obscurely re re researching some obscure point of, you know, medieval charters or uh, whatever. But it's, it's all kinds of different things of wonderful, fascinating subjects. Very good. Uh, well, I believe that uh, we are now uh, come to the, the end of our, our hour plus, hour 10 minutes. So that really must conclude uh, our questions and today's program. Uh, as a first resource, we do want to remind everyone that you can visit the websites of both the College of Arms, and I believe we have screenshots of the home pages to show uh, college-of-arms.gov.uk, uh, uh, which is Peter's institution, uh, and the website of the Committee on Heraldry, uh, committeeonheraldry.org, uh, is a micro site, but autonomously distinct from AmericanAncestors.org, but we are a committee of the same society. Uh, further questions or follow-ups for today's uh, session uh, may be sent by email to us at heraldry at nehgs.org. Uh, as you leave this event now, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. Uh, as American Ancestors continues to expand webinars and online offerings, uh, any and all feedback, particularly of uh, events of this type, is extremely helpful and appreciated. Uh, the webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world, uh, and I think we have had some uh, global attendance today. Please consider making a gift to American Ancestors to help create more programs for you and others to enjoy. Uh, thank you all for attending, uh, and a special thanks to our guest, uh, York Herald, Peter O'Donohue.